This morning, uh, I'm going to attempt to answer the following question. Am I required to place membership at a single church, at a single congregation? Uh, or can I just be a Christian and never uh, join or never be affiliated with one specific church? Uh, can I just be a Christian and go to just any faithful congregation? And uh, let me tell you from the start, there are not many verses which specifically answer this question. Um, probably the clearest verse that I know of uh, is in Acts 9. And here it's speaking about Saul, uh, who's better known by his other name, Paul. And uh, this is shortly after his conversion. So at this point in time, uh, you know, Christ had appeared to him. And if you recall, Christ said, there's something you must do. And uh, that wasn't prayer. You know, Paul prayed for, I think it was three days, prayed and fasted for three days. Uh, and yet he was told by the, again, the will of the Lord that he still needed his sins washed away. Uh, so the thing that he had to do to be right with God was not pray, uh, not even pray and fast for several days. Um, but he was instructed to rise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so this is shortly after his conversion. And before he was converted, uh, Saul was one, Saul, a.k.a. Paul, was one who persecuted the church to the point uh, he was hauling men and women off to prison and even consenting to the death of, of some. And uh, we read the following, Acts 9, 26, When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So I think their, their fear here is... Uh, uh, a, you know, expected one, not necessarily a bad one. They're afraid, right? Here's this guy who's known for perse persecuting the church, and he wants to join himself to these disciples, right? He wants to join himself to this local group of disciples, these disciples in Jerusalem. And naturally, they're afraid. They thought he was, you know, just put it on a show, probably to, you know, take them and put them in prison, right? So they were afraid of him. They didn't think he was a disciple. Uh, but disregarding their fear for a moment... When we look at what Saul's doing here, in the overall context, this is put forward as a good thing. This is a good example that here's this new baptized believer, and he wants to join himself to a local group of disciples. And there's nothing in the New Testament that would, would tell us this was a bad thing or an unscriptural thing. This is set forward as a good example. So it's good if someone is a Christian, if they have not joined themselves to in a local group of disciples, that they should... Uh, do that. And so again, in my mind, this is probably the clearest verse regarding the question of do I have to place membership somewhere? So barring this one example in Acts, to answer this question more thoroughly, we must look at the principles found in the New Testament and then draw um, answers from the overall pattern presented in the scriptures. Now let me just uh, say from the start, what do I mean by placing membership? And the Bible does use some of that language where it talks about us being many, many members in one body. Uh, so what do I mean by us placing membership or someone placing membership? I simply mean what this verse says, right? The idea of you joining yourself to a group of uh, disciples. And people might put it in other terms, you know, having a, a home church. Uh, I, it's not language familiar to me, but I've heard people talking about placing your letter somewhere. I think that's what they say. I'm not positive, but I've heard people use that kind of language. Um, again, the idea of being known and recognized as a member of a local church, of a local congregation, that's what I'm talking about. And, you know, we get plenty of visitors here at the Chestnut Mountain Church of Christ, whether it's friends or family visiting us, or maybe just someone's curious about the Church of Christ and they want to uh, visit. And we're always happy to have visitors. We want to be as friendly and inviting as, as we possibly can. Uh, now, with all that said, you know, a visitor is exactly that. It's someone who's just visiting. You know, it's known that they're just here temporarily and that they're going to uh, return to their home, to their, uh, their area when they're done visiting. And so we, we make a distinction between someone who is a visitor and someone who is a recognized member of this local church. And so let's consider this morning what the New Testament teaches about the importance of placing membership at a local church. 
So number one, let's consider what the New Testament says about the universal church and the local church. And these are two concepts presented um, in the New Testament. We find the idea that there is a universal church or there's a church at large that every Christian is a part of. But then there's also this idea in Scripture that there is a local church. There's churches in the plural on a local level. So first let's consider just a few verses. I'm going to try and go through this point quickly, this first point quickly. Uh, speaking about uh, Jesus Christ, in Colossians 1.18 it says, He is the head of the body, which is the church, or just the church. And uh, notice the emphasis here on the singular nature of the church. You know, Jesus is the head of the body, singular body, not bodies, but body, uh, and that body is the church. Uh, we find similar language in Ephesians uh, 1, the end of Ephesians 1. Um, here it's speaking about God the Father and what God the Father has done regarding Christ. And hath put all things under his feet, this is under the feet of Christ, all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And we're told in the same epistle, if you read chapter 4, Ephesians 4, that there's one body, right? So Christ is head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is his body, very clear. And we're told there is one body. And so we should understand that every person who is saved, at that very moment when they have believed and obeyed the gospel, they're added to that one body. So every saved person is automatically part of the universal church. Right? They're part of that, that one body. We are many members who collectively make up the one body of Christ, the universal church. And uh, this is a metaphor, and it's used you know, rather frequently in the New Testament, the idea of the human body. Right? We have many members, we have various parts, we have our fingers and we have our toes and our eyes and our ears and nose and so on. And uh, none of these things by themselves is valuable, right? If I cut off my finger, it's not going to do me any good just flopping around by itself, right? All the parts comprise the body as a whole. And so all Christians together comprise the universal church. Again, that singular body, the one body. And Jesus being the head of that body. Now with this in mind, the New Testament also speaks about the local church. Right? It's evident if you just do a very basic overview of some of the books in the New Testament, you can see this. In Acts, uh, the book of Acts, for example, we read about the church in Jerusalem. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 in the opening statements of, of that epistle. It says, under the church of God, which is at Corinth. So we read about a church in Jerusalem. We read about a church in Corinth. In 1 Thessalonians, the very first verse, it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians. And then the thought continues in that verse. So again, we read about these local uh, churches. And we see that very clearly throughout the, the New Testament. And the notice here, we do find the word church in the plural. Romans 16, 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches... Of Christ salute you, and uh, you know kissing someone on the cheek. Even today, it's a common greeting in, in some uh, parts of the world. Um, but again, notice here, church is in the plural. Now, Paul is not contradicting himself when he wrote by inspiration other letters that again, there's Jesus Christ, the head. There is His body, and the body is the church, and there's one body. Again, this is he's simply speaking of the church here on the local level. There are many churches. In, in the plural, um, locally speaking. Again, just as there was a church in Jerusalem and one at Corinth and one at Thessalonica uh, and so on. These were churches of Christ. And so the New Testament does, again, speak of a universal church that all Christians are a part of. And it also speaks about the local church, a local congregation. And so to answer our question, do I have to place membership at a specific church uh, we have to see that distinction in the New Testament, that there is a difference uh, between the local church and the universal uh, church. And uh, that brings us to number two. Um, let's talk about local church uh, membership. And really, uh, we're going to focus again on a local church from this point forward. 
And I'd just like to reiterate, when a person is saved, it's at that very moment uh, they are added to the church at large. Every Christian throughout the world belongs to the body of Christ. Again, the singular body, the one body of Christ. And Christ himself is the head of that body, the church. And I want to repeat this because it's important we see that the way a person becomes a member of the church is through their faithful obedience. Uh, a person does not become a member of the church by the church taking a vote or us coming up, you know, just as uninspired men, us coming up with a list of rules and saying, well, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And uh, if you follow these rules we made up, then you'll become, you know, part of the church. No, a person is added to the church, again, through their faith, uh, through their faithful obedience uh, to God's will. And that's true for the universal church. And if we're being faithful as a local congregation, the same is true for this local congregation. We don't vote people in. You know, we just want to be certain. We might ask someone some questions if they want to place membership. Just to be certain that they're actually following what the New Testament says, that they've truly submitted to God's, submitted to God's will, that they're saved, and uh, that they're, again, following the Scriptures. And that's the standard we follow. Um, it's not about us voting people in or making up our own rules. It's about faith in God and His Word. And so all Christians are part of that universal church. A faithful brother or sister in a different city, uh, in a different uh, state, or even a different country, you know, we're all part of that one church. But that faithful brother or sister is not part of this church, right? You know, if they're even just the next city over or a couple streets over, whatever it may be, they're worshiping at their local congregation, right? And we worship here at this uh, local church. And so I submit for your consideration the answer to the question, you know, am I required, and we're talking about, you know, the, what the New Testament teaches, and that's when to be faithful to the New Testament, am I required to place membership at a local congregation, um, or can I just be a Christian and not be affiliated with any church? And I submit for your consideration, the answer to this question is yes, that a person must place membership at a local church, his or her local church. And the following are three reasons why I believe the New Testament teaches this. And uh, here are the three sub-points up on the screen. We talk briefly about togetherness, the New Testament idea of togetherness and us having cooperation and working together, the command to congregate, and then three, the oversight of bishops. So let's talk about uh, togetherness. When you read through the New Testament, you find the example many times of Christians working together. Uh, whether it's us worshiping together, evangelizing together, or just you know, fellowshipping uh, together and whatever endeavor we're doing, whatever good endeavor we're doing, even something just as basic as uh, you know, feeding one another a meal, right? We see this idea of togetherness uh, repeated throughout uh, the New Testament. Uh, in Acts 2, 44, it says, All that believed were together and had all things common. Verse 46, They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so here we see our early brethren, again, were committed to one another. They were a support system. They were a family. And that's what we should endeavor to be today as the Lord's Church in the year, uh, what's the year? <laughs> 2022, right? Uh, Paul wrote uh, a letter to the Corinthians. And uh, it's evident when you read this letter, this was a church that struggled with uh, division and friction. And he said to them, for by one spirit... Are we all baptized into one body? So again, this idea of there being one body, the universal church, the universal people that belong to the Lord. He says, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit. And then notice he says in verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. Right. So again, he's writing to this local church talking about that one body we're all a part of because there were issues of division and friction uh, among them. And he goes on and he elaborates in great detail what he's talking about. He talks about, you know, if the body were just an eye, right? 
just an eyeball rolling around, well, that's not a body. That's not going to be helpful. You know, if you're just an ear flopping around on the ground, well, again, your body's more than the ear. So, again, he talks about all of us as individuals coming together, working together to be the complete body uh, of Christ. And so he wrote these words by inspiration to encourage these Christians to, uh, to work together. Now, we should understand that all work is ultimately done on a local level, right? As far as I know, maybe with the exception of the early times in the book of Acts, I really don't know of any time where the entire church came together in one place. I just don't think that's possible nowadays, uh, seeing that you know, we're in the millions. Uh, all work is going to be done on a local level. And uh, let me just give you a few examples of that. Let's say there's a sister in Christ here. You know, Shay, I know, does a lot regarding, uh, um, you know, putting meals together and things like that. Works of benevolence is what I was trying to say. And uh, let's say she wants to get some meals together to give to someone who's in need, right? And whether she's calling upon ladies to help her or men to help her, is she going to call upon a visitor to help her put meals together or someone who just comes infrequently? You know, probably not, unless it's her sister or something or someone that was really close to her. She's going to call on a member, right? She's going to call upon uh, recognized members of this congregation to help you know, do something that's, that's good for others. Um, another example, you know, Stan puts the schedule together for the men uh, who participate in, in worship. And as he's putting the schedule together, you know, those who are going to lead a prayer, those who are going to serve on the table, is Stan going to put down someone who's a visitor? No, of course not. You know, he's going to put down someone who's a member uh, of this local church. Now, we might know someone who's visiting, a friend or family. They might be called upon to lead a prayer. But again, the everyday, you know, in and out of, of what goes on here, we're going to rely on uh, people who actually attend and uh, people who are recognized uh, members of this uh, local church. So let's think about something just maybe, I don't know, a little more serious, but something more permanent in nature. Uh, what if we ever get to the point as a church where we need to appoint more leadership, that we need to uh, select men to serve as elders and deacons? Would we, again, go to visitors and select them? Or someone who, again, attends uh, infrequently? Or, again, or someone who's not interested in joining this church, joining this local congregation? We can know that, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, if we're going to appoint someone to lead this congregation... We're going to appoint someone who wants to be here, right? Uh, who wants to serve this local uh, church. So again, this, these ideas of togetherness and cooperation, it, it extends beyond just us worshiping Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, it's about uh, virtually everything we do. You know, we're going to call upon uh, people we know are reliable and people who you know, have made that commitment to be a part of this church and attend this local congregation. If we desire to fulfill the New Testament principles of togetherness and cooperation, then it stands to reason that we should, uh, every single one of us should desire, as, as Paul did, uh, again, just to use the biblical language as much as I can, we should have that desire, i got to go way back, that desire to be joined to a local group of disciples. Um, next, let's uh, consider the command to congregate. If you look up the word church in a Greek dictionary, because the New Testament was originally written in Greek, the fundamental definition of the word church is congregation. Right? Every time you read about the church in the Bible, and in the King James uh, Version, it's mentioned uh, just a little over 100 times. Every time you read about the church in the Bible... You're reading about a group of people who congregate, uh, who come together. And because most versions will translate the term ecclesia as church, sometimes we miss out on this meaning. Uh, we miss out on the ideas associated with a congregation. Uh, when people hear the word church, I, I think most people will think of this building, you know, or a similar structure where Christians will go to worship. But we should understand the New Testament never defines church that way. And the church is the people. Uh, the church is the congregation. I'm the church. You're the church. Again, together we are members who make up the body. Right? The church is not a, uh, simply a location or a building. It's, it's the people. 
And uh, if you read your New Testament carefully, you, you can see this, again, how the word is used. You know, here Paul is writing to Philemon. And in verses 2 and 3 he says, <laughs> Our beloved Amphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, notice he says, and the church in your house. And, and again, the thought continues here. But you know, here Paul says Philemon had a church in his house. Right? Well, did he mean he had a building in his house? You know, no. He's, again, he's talking about the disciples who assembled or congregated in Philemon's house. Again, with the specific intent to, to worship and, uh, and work for the Lord. Uh, so that's the King James Version. Most translations will read that way. You can see up on the screen, I also have a version called Young's Literal Translation. And notice I've highlighted the term church in the King James. And in Young's Literal, it translates that same term as assembly. Right? It says, Aphia, the beloved in Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the assembly in your house. So that's a little clearer, right? You know, he's writing to an assembly, to a group of people who met in Philemon's house. Now, why do I mention this? Well, if we're called the assembly, again, that's what ecclesia generally means. Ecclesia, church, means assembly, it means congregation. Well, that implies we're people who assemble, Right? You know, if we're called the congregation some hundred times over in the New Testament, that means we congregate. So again, that's going to take place on a local level, right? We're going to congregate somewhere. And not only is this concept inherent in us being called ecclesia, the congregation, but it is explicitly stated as well. You can hear the Bible says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love, and good works. And how do we do that? How do we encourage one another, provoke one another to love and good works? Well, he tells us in verse, you know, verse 25 there, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day uh, approaching. So again, if we're going to assemble, and it's going to be somewhere, it's going to be on a local level. We're going to go to a you know, local congregation. We're going to congregate. We're going to uh, assemble. Now, again, someone might ask, well, can I just go to any faithful church and that be fine? You know, if I want to go here one Sunday to, I don't know, the Atlanta Road Church of Christ, and then I want to go you know, the next Sunday to the, the Buford Church of Christ, and can I just go to any faithful congregation? Isn't that fine? Well, yes and no. It depends on what, what you mean by that. You know, as I mentioned, uh, I just took a few days off. And we weren't here Sunday because we visited um, some other uh, churches. So we went to the Avondale Church of Christ for morning worship. In the evening, we went to uh, the Monroe Church of Christ. Now, was it wrong for us to do that? I hope not. <laughs> I don't think it was. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it was. And, uh, again, it's, it's not something I do every Sunday, right? It'd be kind of hard for me to be your preacher and be going to a different church every Sunday. You know, how, how would that work? So again, it's just logistically, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but again, even when we did that, there's an understanding when we went to Avondale, when we went to Monroe, that we're just visiting, right? That we're just visiting. We're not actually members there. We're members here. Uh, and again, the people we know understand that, um, that difference. So again, is it wrong to just attend some you know, churches wherever you want? No, it's not necessarily wrong. Um, but if my mentality is, again, I just don't want to be a part of any church, again, I don't want to be associated with one specific church, and I just want to kind of float around, um, again, I would say that's not biblical. And uh, for the reasons I just presented, right, again, if you want to be fully involved in whatever we're doing, whether it's works of benevolence or participating in worship or possibly becoming a, a leader in the church, becoming an elder or deacon, you can't do any of those things if you're not someone we can rely on, if you're not a recognized member of this church, if you're not joined to us. And uh, also, um, one of the reasons a person um, cannot do that and, and can fully be active what the New Testament teaches is because part of the New Testament pattern for the church is the oversight of bishops. The oversight of bishops. Uh, part of God's plan for the church is to have qualified men serve as leaders in each local congregation. 
And one of the biblical names for these men is bishop. Is bishop. Um, literally, the Greek term here is overseer. You know, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But a bishop or an overseer, this name describes what these men do or part of what these men do. Right? Uh, these men who meet the God-given qualifications, they're given the task to oversee the church. Again, the local church. They are to superintend, they are to oversee the local congregation they are part of. Now, what are the qualifications for bishops? What all do they do? How extensive is their authority? And those are all great questions for a different time and a different sermon, right? That's, that's a whole other you know, hour if you want to talk about that. So we're not going to do that this morning. Uh, but let me just point out the fact that part of God's design is for each local congregation, each local church, uh, to be overseen by a plurality of bishops. That's part of God's plan for the church, for each local congregation to be overseen by a plurality of bishops. And let me just give you one passage that speaks to this. And this is Titus 1, verses 5 and following. You'll hear Paul is writing to Titus, who's a preacher. And so he says to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. As I had appointed thee, if any uh, be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless. And then the thought continues in verse 7. Now you can see here I've highlighted a few terms up on the screen. So I've highlighted the term wanting. And it should be understood a church can be faithful and can exist and serve God faithfully if they have no bishops. Right? A church can exist and have no bishops. But the New Testament says they are found wanting. Right? They are lacking something uh, if there's a church that has uh, no bishops. Again, it's part of God's design for the church to have uh, bishops. So this is something we should always uh, desire to have, always aspire to have. We want bishops in the church. Uh, again, I've uh, highlighted the term elders. And in verse 7, uh, bishop. And, and I just want to highlight those because in this context, these terms are used interchangeably. Right? An elder and a bishop are one and the same. Right? There's not a different group, one group of men called elders, and then a different group of men known as bishops. Okay, according to the New Testament, these, these are two names or titles for the same group of men. An elder is a bishop. A bishop is an elder. They're one and the same. Now, this is the King James. Uh, the New King James and many others will use the term bishop. Um, other translations, such as the ESV, and some more contemporary uh, translations. Instead of saying bishop, they'll say overseer. So it's the same Greek word, it's just translated uh, differently. So uh, for those who are interested, the actual Greek word here is episkopos. And uh, we have the prefix there, epi. Epi means outer or over, so like your epidermis is your outer layer of skin. And then uh, the rest of the word skopos, you can think of the word like scope. Uh, which means to see. So it's literally episcopos, overseer, right? And some people wonder, well, where did the term bishop come from? Well, bishop is essentially the Greek word. You know, over the years, the Greek was used, and it changed a little bit. You know, uh, episcopos got shortened to uh, piscop, piscop, bishop, bishop. And so over the years, uh, episcopos was shortened to bishop. Um, but again, just the literal word means overseer. We should know that um, as Christians. Again, it's describing one of the tasks, the God-given tasks of these qualified uh, men. And we can see that uh, clearly in other passages. Um, here in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, again, it's, you know, Peter is writing to elders. And he says to them, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And so not only are they called bishops or overseers as a title, but again, we see that this is what they're charged to do. 
They're charged to take the oversight, again, not of all churches or plurality of churches, but notice they are to feed the flock of God which is among them. So again, this is talking about the local work of a uh, bishop. And so not only are bishops given this task to exercise oversight, but the rest of us are called upon to respect their authority as they oversee us in accordance to God's will. And you know, there's many passages uh, you know, about this. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You know, a bishop's job can be hard. They have to deal with a lot of, you know, issues that you and I don't have to, you know, deal with. You know, family and trouble is probably going to go to the, the bishops. You know, ultimately, that's what they're going to do. And so we shouldn't make their job any harder than it already, already is. We'd want them to and serve with joy. Um, also, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 12 and following says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them, notice again the language here, which labor among you. So again, it's talking about their, their local work. They have authority over the local congregation they're a part of. To know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And notice, what are we to think of our bishops? We are to esteem them very highly in love for the work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And so again, I bring this up because, again, I'll just use myself as an example if I don't want to be affiliated with any specific church, and I just kind of want to go wherever I want, then I am not submitting to the God-given authority of bishops if I'm attending a congregation where they're, they're blessed to have bishops. So again, it's part of God's plan for each church to have overseers. And then, again, if I'm going to be where they are, part of their local flock, uh, I'm going to be one. If I'm following God, I want to be faithful to God, I'm going to submit to their authority. And if I'm going to do that, I can't just be, you know, calling people or whatever. You know, I can't just be, <laughs> sorry, I'm just kidding. Uh, I can't just, you know, go wherever I want, right? Uh, I have to be uh, willing to uh, submit to their, their, their authority. And, uh, you know, typically this is the time I give the invitation, and the invitation is always extended. If there's anyone here who is not a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, day or night, you can call me. And we will do whatever is necessary, whatever it takes for you to believe and obey the gospel, uh, being immersed in that watery grave with Jesus Christ and, and risen to walk in newness of life. And you can do that at this time if you desire. Again, the invitation to, to become a Christian is always extended. Always, uh, you can always reach out to me. Um, considering the topic I've preached on this morning, let me quickly offer uh, another invitation. And if there is anyone here today... Uh, for whatever reason, I know there's, there's all kinds of reasons why someone might be visiting um, and, not, and not have placed membership, but if there's anyone here, and this is an invitation to those who are already Christians, right? Just like Saul had heeded the Lord's call to rise and be baptized and have his sins washed away, calling on his name, and how after he'd done that, he wanted to join himself to a local group of Christians. So this is an invitation for those who are Christians already those who have believed and obeyed the gospel. Um, if there's anyone who fits that criteria and for whatever reason is not a member of this local church, the Chestnut Mountain Church of Christ, we invite you to place membership with us. Again, in the spirit of togetherness, in the spirit of obeying the New Testament example to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we come together as the church, that we, we assemble, we come together in one place. And also in the spirit of submitting to God's plan for the church, which, it, which does include the oversight of, of bishops, we humbly ask you, uh, again, just to join yourself to us, to use the biblical uh, language, to become a recognized member of this uh, local congregation. And uh, if there's anyone who's visiting, you know, just temporarily to you know, return back home, again, I believe these are biblical principles, and so this would apply to you as well when you go back home. If you're not, again, for whatever reason, if you're not a member of your local church, you, know, you, should, you should endeavor to do that. I think that's a, that's a good thing. Now, just very quickly, how does someone become a member of this local church? It's very easy. Um, but would you care to raise your hand? Mike and Stan? Yeah, does everyone know who Mike is? Is there anyone visiting who doesn't know Mike and Stan? 
You know, after we dismiss this morning, just speak with them and express your desire to be a member here. And they'll just ask you a few questions, again, just to be certain that you've faithfully obeyed with the New Testament. Again, it's not about voting you in or anything like that. We just want to be certain that people uh, are following what the New Testament teaches. And it really is that simple. Just talk to Mike or Stan. Again, if you don't know who they are, ask one of us. We'll tell you who they are. And again, they'll just ask you a few questions about your conversion and uh, your life as a Christian. And that's pretty much it. They'll just announce that you're a member here. And again, we want to uh, work together with everyone in the spirit of togetherness. We want to be encouragement to each other. And we want to fulfill what the New Testament uh, teaches, that we're all part of the universal church. But we also do have a specific calling to be part of a local church that we can work together here in this church, in this area, to glorify God.